morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you all for coming to the uh, first in our Visioning Scholars of Color series. I'm Sean Harper. I'm on the faculty here in the Graduate School of Education. Uh, this particular series is really special, not only to our ed school, but to the three other schools of education um, at which it has traveled. Uh, it started 27 years ago at Michigan <laughs> State University when our now former dean, Andy Porter, was a professor there. And he started it as an occasion to bring rock star faculty members of color to Michigan State, and he took it with them to Wisconsin, then to Vanderbilt, and, and now to Penn. Over the last nine years, I've had the pleasure of working with Andy, and now with our new dean, Cam Grossman, and our assistant dean, Jesse Harper, to continue the rich story legacy of the series. Uh, some of the other scholars of color that have been a part of this remember some of them, Lori Lassamilli, for example, Pedro Nogueira, um, Linda Darling Hammond, Vivian Gaston. <laughs> <laughs> so so it, really, it really is a distinguished roster, and we are so delighted to add to it uh, today with our, with our most recent visiting scholar, whom you, are, you will hear much more about in a second. Um, if there are students here who would be interested in joining Professor Jones Harden for lunch and uh, a post discussion, a post presentation discussion about her work, I think we have about four more seats left uh, for the doctoral or, or graduate student lunch. So just see me at the end and um, I'll add you to the group. Um, so that, that would be lovely. All right. Without further ado, I would like to turn this over to my colleague and dear friend, John Fantuzzo, who is the Albert Greenfield Professor here at Penn GSE, who, will, who nominated our speaker and who will introduce her. John? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, rock, rock star scholar. Um, that's what we have the privilege of, of uh, hearing from today. And it's my pleasure to sort of share with you a little bit about uh, Dr. Jones Harden. She's an associate professor at the Department of Human Development and Quantitative Methodology at the University of Maryland at College Park. And I had a wonderful opportunity of, of visiting her and her leadership role in, in, uh, in that program. Her research examines school readiness and mental health of young children at environmental risk, particularly those who have experienced trauma. And I deeply admire this dear colleague and friend. Um, and I wanted to tell you my three reasons for deep admiration of, of her. Um, first, she has dedicated her passion and talent to serve the most vulnerable group of humans on this planet, children zero to three. This group of humans, particularly in the United States, is disproportionately experiences the highest rate of poverty, the highest level of maltreatment, uh, the highest level of domestic violence, and the highest level of homelessness uh, compared to any other group uh, of uh, humans in the United States. So, so anything about brain research and all that stuff, we understand that our most formative human beings are subject to the most highest levels of trauma. So shame on us, right? Yeah. But Dr. Hardin positions herself as a, as a scholar and as an advocate and supporter for that group. Not only that, but she positions herself in the midst of their trauma. So the question is, it's one thing to be concerned about zero or the three. It's another thing to go into a shelter. It's another thing to be working in a child protective service agency. It's another thing to be with them in their trauma. And as one who has some experience of conducting research with child maltreatment, trying to conduct quality research with vulnerable populations in trauma is Herculean. And you have to have a heart and soul to do that research, and this is what my colleague has, uh, very, very much so. And then the third thing that I just love about Bre Brenda Hart Jones Harden is that in the midst, so she goes to the vulnerable population, she goes to them not when it's convenient, but when they're in trauma, 
And then what she does is she tries to bring out the best of the children, families, and programs um, in the midst of the worst situation. So she positions her work to find protective factors, to find what is good and, 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 and keep us away from a, de a deficit mentality, kicking folks when they're down. And so I, 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 I sort of feel like she, she is an inspiration to us all because she goes out to the deep waters of research, practice, and policy. Not the convenient places, I call them the deep, the deep waters. And for, the, for over 35 years, she has sought to make visible the needs of these children and their families through research and, her, and advocacy. And she's positioned herself nationally at major organizations, zero to three, early head start, home visiting programs, major national places. She's been called in to be an advocate, to bring her research, and to seek good policies for them. So she's just an extraordinary human being, and we're very fortunate to have her here. It's not just the head that she's bringing. She's bringing the whole package uh, to our most vulnerable kids. And so thank you so much for willing us to come here. So without further ado, let's welcome her. Thank you all. Um, and John, you shouldn't do that because you make me want to cry. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. He and I have a mutual love fest, and I have to tell you can see why. Um, he came to my department. I have to tell you, the first thing he said to these students was, if you don't love children, you shouldn't be in the business. And they were all like staring because nobody ever socializes students that way. Mm -hmm. But John and I both feel that if you don't have a passion for these kinds of kids, you shouldn't be doing the work. What he didn't tell you was that I started my work as a practitioner. Um, I was a social worker um, up the road in New York City and really decided that I wanted to work for these little kids and families the rest of my career. Now, I will tell you, and see, John, you got me crying. I will tell you that it got to be really hard to be on the front line, and I couldn't leave the work, so I had to figure out some way that I could keep myself from being burned out and giving up. So what I've tried to do in my career, which I wouldn't necessarily advocate for all of you young scholars in here, but I've tried to walk the line between scholarship and practice. Not good when you have to go up for tenure and you have to go up for promotion to full, which Sean knows I'm in the throes of now. Sean and I had a great breakfast this morning talking about these things. Um, so it makes you look different in the academy, but I can't imagine doing anything different. So I'll just have to be an anomaly the rest of my career. <laughs> That's just it. So today, obviously, I'm talking about something that's really close to my heart. And I do feel very, very fortunate because, you know, there was this book by Katherine Graham, I love memoirs, and she was the woman who was the publisher of the Washington Post. She had this line in her book that said, I feel so lucky that I can get up and go do something that I want to do every morning. And that's how I feel about my work. 35 years later. So the other thing I'd say to graduate students in here is to find your niche, find something that you really love to do because it's a long career you can have. And if you can feel like, gosh, I really like it, it makes all the politics of academia seem palatable. So anyway, I'm going to talk about this area, which has been the area that I've worked on, as John said, for 35 years. But I'm going to start by giving you a couple of frameworks that are more recent. And you know, I sort of laugh with my colleagues because I said, oh my god, we've been studying this stuff for 35 years. Nobody's cared. But somebody comes up with these very nice, sexy frameworks, and all of a sudden it gets on NPR. But I'll take that. I'll take that because then it means there's more money for me to get. So I want to start with a slide that sort of grounds me and I hope it helps you all to understand what is the underpinning of all that I'm going to talk to you all about. And this um, is um, a slide that I stole from zero to three. I'm on the board, so I get to steal slides from them. But this slide really I love because, first of all, look at this baby touching mommy's finger. And it talks about this is a neonate who's already pre-wired to connect to the world. 
right? That's what is uniquely human about all of us, about this baby, that already she's ready to say, I want to be a part of another. And what we know about even these relationships, actually we can go back before the neonatal period and go back to the fetal period, right? There's things that are going on in terms of attachment of the fetus to the mom, even during pregnancy, is that we know that it affects the brain. And this is not a session where I'm going to go into great detail of the brain, but I am going to show you a couple of slides about the brain to just, you know, ground us all in how important this is. But as we know, this early brain development affects every single aspect of development, right? Physical health, mental health, social, emotional, cognitive, language, every aspect of mental health really come from some of the earliest experiences that children have. Now, I'm quick to say that we still can grow and mature even when you're my age, right? You can still produce neurons and you can get better, but it just doesn't work like it does when you're a little person. So what does this mean for us is that we really, really have to invest our time, efforts, energy, scholarship, everything we can into this youngest group of children. Okay. So here's one of the frameworks I want to present to you. And some of you may have heard about this. Vince Folletti is this very handsome Italian man with a shock of gray hair. He's been on all the radio shows and all the TV shows. It helps that he's handsome. He can get this out. But remember this study, right? He did this with a group of basically middle class people who were part of an insurance fund. And it was not something that we would have accepted in our world. It was a study, basically a retrospective study, which we all know isn't so great. He asked people yes, no, right? There's not a whole lot of variability in yes, no, those kind of categorical variables. But because he was able to have these findings based on this kind of really not that we would consider up to par kind of survey, it's pretty daunting. So what is this adverse childhood experience? It's just to remind some of you who may have heard about it, right? So they looked at, they asked people, Tell me, in your childhood, have you or have you not experienced any of these things? Emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, domestic violence against the mother, household member with mental illness, household member with substance abuse, household member ever in prison. There were several more, right? What they found was when they asked these people these very, you know, vague kind of questions, not a really good psychometrically sound measure, that they could predict the 10 leading causes of adult death and disability. Wish I had had this study 35 years ago, right? Because we care about this in this country. We don't care a lot about little teeny babies who happen to be maltreated or homeless, but we care about people dying who are middle class. So let's take this apart a little more, right? So they compared, again, not something we would do. We would be much more stringent about our criteria, et cetera. But they compared people who had zero of these adverse childhood experiences to people who had four or more, kind of like <laughs> our cumulative risk indices that we might use in developmental psychology. What did they find? Twice as likely to smoke if you had four, four and a half times more likely to be depressed, 12 times more likely to attempt suicide, seven times more likely to be alcoholics, four and a half more likely uh, to be drug using, and five and a half more likely to abuse their partner. Now this got everybody awake, right? So they said, what in the world is going on? Now of course, those of us like John and I who've been studying this stuff forever, we're like, you all just figuring this out. But <laughs> this has really helped us. Okay, so this is from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. And what they have suggested in this pyramid is if you think about these adverse childhood experiences, most of which you know we're talking about in early childhood, it leads to problems with children's neurodevelopment, right? We know it affects the brain, all the social, emotional, and cognitive impairments that go <laughs> along with that, leading to the adoption of health risk behaviors, leading to higher rates of disease, disability, and then early death. So there's now even research, public health people are looking at telomere length, you know, that part of the neuron that um, helps you to think about premature cellular aging, and they have found that even the cells of people who've experienced early stress are more likely to age more quickly so that you get premature death. 
Okay, so now we've got the physicians paying attention, we've got the insurance companies paying attention, stuff that psychologists have known about for a long time. So the other framework I want to talk to you all about is Jack Shonkoff's framework. He's another uh, pediatrician. Physicians have a lot more power than psychologists, as you all will. If you don't know already, you should know. Um, but he is somebody who has been committed to thinking about children at risk. He started his career looking at kids with disabilities, did a great handbook that I still use on early intervention, et cetera. But he decided in the second half of his career that he wanted to think about children who are vulnerable writ large. He got a great gig at Harvard. They basically gave him some money and say, do what you want to do. He created the Center for the Developing Child. If any of you haven't looked on that website, you should. They're like great little clips, video clips you can use to teach your classes, briefs that you can use to use for advocacy purposes, etc. But anyway, he created this framework where he talked about children's exposure to stress. So he talked about positive stress. So for a little baby, positive stress might be on a cold winter morning, your mom taking you out of your nice, warm, comfy crib, changing your diaper, because changing your diaper can be stressful because you don't like to be naked. You really don't like, you like to have things over you. Then she stuffs you in this big old snowsuit, which you hate because you feel all congested and constricted and all this kind of stuff. And then she takes you to the babysitter's house, right? Not happy, not happy, but, but it's okay because in the end the babysitter takes off your clothes, says I'm so happy to see you and you can get on the floor and have your great day, right? Tolerable stress, like okay, I'm going to the pediatrician and I have to get that horrible shot, right? My mom does not protect me from this mean pediatrician. She lets this person come at me with this thing that I don't know what it is and it hurts. And she sits there and lets him do it, and I'm crying and crying, and all she's saying is it's going to be okay. Well, that doesn't, that's not so fun. It feels horrible. You worry why your mom isn't protecting you. But it's tolerable because it's quick. It's over. Mommy's kissing you. She's hugging you. She's giving you food. Life is good, right? But then there's this thing called toxic stress. And I want to give you Jack's definition verbatim. Strong, frequent, and or prolonged activation of the body stress response system. So he gets really physiological with it. And you can think about cortisol, and I won't tell you a lot about that, but we're doing a study with cortisol. First time I've ever done physiologic research in my life, but I'll tell you about that later. But here is the phrase that I want you to pay attention to. In the absence of stable adult support. In the absence of stable adult support. So his argument is, you know, a lot of kids, unfortunately, have to experience this. If you have somebody who says, I know life is hard, but I love you and I'm going to try to protect you, right? That it makes it probably go up to the tolerable stress category. Now, obviously, there are a lot of kids who experience this. Right? who've seen people get murdered, who have seen their uncle die of AIDS, who've seen their mother get incarcerated because of something, who've seen their father get deported because of immigration, who are experiencing this stress without stable adult support. And those are the kids that I'm interested in. And what I want to do is change that from absence to the presence. So that's the focus of my work. So I want to just give you a little more about Sean Cuff really quickly, and then we'll go into my work. Right here are the things that he says puts children in the toxic stress category. Poverty, I say to my students, the great disequalizer, right? You all know. You look at any developmental health indicator, and you know poor children look worse, right? That's just a no-brainer. You add to that sociodemographic risk, like not having two parents, like being a child of a teen mother, it gets worse. You add to it trauma like intimate partner violence, it gets worse. You add to it parental mental illness and substance abuse, it gets worse. You add child maltreatment, it gets worse. You add lack of stable care outside of the maltreating parent, it gets worse. What I like to say to people is here are the kids in the child welfare system. Every last one of these risk factors are these children. So obviously, you know, going back to my years as a child welfare social worker, I am very interested in these children, but very humbled by the number of risk factors that they have to deal with every day. So certainly they are the ones who fall in this category. Couple other quick things I want to tell you about 
Jack's toxic stress framework. Obviously, he says these children are stressed out of their minds, which means they have a lower threshold for responsiveness to stress. So for example, a little baby hears a big noise, maybe something drops in her child care center. She loses it, right? Hysterically crying, can't console her, even the best caregiver in the place can't console her, partly because she's been stressed every day. So she has a lower threshold, right? Disrupted brain architecture and functioning. I'm going to show you a couple slides about that. Something interesting that they've talked about in the physiological public health world, this is not my area, but I have been so amazed by some of the stuff coming out of public health, effects on other organ systems. And one of the examples that I've learned from my public health colleagues, for example, is this one where they found this problem, this insidious problem among African American women that they keep producing higher rates of premature and low birth weight babies, despite class. That's the thing that's so surprising to me. I mean, I understand poor women are more likely to have children prematurely. But middle class women, they have this hypothesis they call the weathering hypothesis that the stress that African American women have experienced over generations still is in their bodies. And so they're ending up producing these babies. And the public health people just can't get rid of this problem. It's a huge, huge issue for them. And some of them um, argue that this is because of this multi-generational stress that African American women have had to deal with. Of course, health, cognitive, mental health challenges. And here's the thing that's getting us some money now, because people are saying, whew, these toxic, stressful experiences are at the root of the disparities between poor and middle class people, minorities and majority people, in terms of health and mental health. And that's costing our society a lot of money. OK, so I'm going to show you a couple quick slides, architecture and brain functioning. This is, again, from Jack Shonkoff's um, great website. I highly recommend it. Um, so here he's looking at a kid with normal stress and another kid who's experienced toxic stress. And what he's pointing out is if you look at the neurons here, lots of connections across here, far fewer for the kid who's experienced toxic stress. So if you think about something like school readiness, right, you need a whole bunch of neuronal connections to do executive functioning, to learn how to read and all that kind of stuff. If you don't have them all, well, then your, your brain is compromised, right? You can't work as efficiently. Your brain can't work as efficiently, and you certainly can't learn to read and write. Here's another one slide. that This comes from Wayne State University. This is a PET scan. This tells you a little bit about brain functioning. So on this side is a healthy kid. On this side is a neglected kid. Red and yellow is good. Like red is when your brain is really, really working. Yellow is when it's active. So you want to see lots of red and yellow, right? Well, so look at all this nice bright red and yellow nicely here. This is like the front, the prefrontal cortex, the temporal lobes on this side, the back of the brain here. And you all know prefrontal cortex is really important, right? That's where you get all your executive functioning and all that kind of stuff. Temporal lobe, you need language. If you don't have language, you certainly can't read. Well, look at this neglected child. You know, so what we see is at the level of the brain architecture and the level of brain functioning, being a kid who's experienced toxic stress just ain't good for you. Okay? All right. So I want to move now away from these two frameworks, but understand that these frameworks really guide my thinking in a lot of ways. So we know the data basically support this, right? So you look at poverty, you know it's a major risk factor for everything under the sun. But as John said, if you are a poor little kid, it matters more than if you are a poor big kid. Some people argue it's because of things like health, right? Things like some of the early attachment experiences, many mechanisms for this. But what we know is that poverty in early childhood is more pervasive and more persistent in terms of maladaptive outcomes. But this is to go back to what John was saying. If you get some positive parenting, right, it looks like it can mediate some of the risks that you might have experienced, some of the early childhood adversities, right? So we can't just say, oh, these children are with poor parents. We can say, what can we do to improve the parenting that these children are experiencing? 
I'm not arguing that we should take them all out of their homes at all, at all. In fact, I'm much more of a prevention person. I say, let's work with what they got so we don't have to add another disruption for these children. Let's see if we can't help these parents to be more positive. And we, of course, know from the research that there's lots of negative parenting in these families, and it's really strongly linked to negative outcomes. So again, we want to flip this around so that these children are experiencing a little better parenting. All right. So now I'm going to start telling you about some studies that I've done to try and look more deeply at the parenting issue as well as at um, the use of early childhood intervention as a way to address the parenting issue. So first study I want to tell you about grad student and I looking at early Head Start families, right? The two samples that I most often use are early Head Start families because that's where you can get all poor children and children in the child welfare system because as I said, they've experienced all those risk factors. So in this first study, we did find that maternal sensitivity, right, positive parenting, these are very poor, very high risk families, did mediate the impact of all of these risks on kids' outcomes. And here we were looking mostly at behavior problems. So if parents not only, we knew they were all poor because that's how you get an early head start, but whether they reported that they had resources, and not just financial resources, but somebody to watch their kids, things like that. If the mother was just stressed out about parenting these kids, it did not help us in terms of maternal depression. Didn't help us in terms of maternal depression. Which says to us, and this is something we're thinking about in terms of our intervention, that you need to add something additional in when you have a mother who's depressed. It helps, right? It helps to get her parenting up, but you gotta add something else to it, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that later. Okay, so this is just our big SEM model, and here's maternal sensitivity in here. Here's our latent factor of child social emotional functioning. Here, problem behaviors, aggressive behaviors, but we also had a measure of social confidence that we um, use. So you can see here, Maternal depression is just not being affected in this model at all, so we have to think about some other kinds of things we have to do with those parents. Okay, another one looking at negative parenting. I've been really interested in maternal detachment. There's been a lot of work on negative parenting, for example, intrusiveness, punitiveness, things like that. So I wanted to look at this issue of maternal detachment because one of the things I'm really interested in is children who've been neglected. And how, as you all might know, if you think about children who've been maltreated, young children, 75% of them are neglected, right? Not abused. The newspaper likes to tell you all about physical abuse and all this kind of stuff. The majority of the children are neglected. So I wanted to think about maternal detachment as a potential proxy for that. And what we found was, as you would imagine, cumulative risk did relate to maternal detachment, but so did this issue of parenting stress, which has become something that's come out in our work a lot, that it is the stress from dealing with the kid on a day-to-day -day basis that seems to be predicting a lot of these outcomes. So we want to think about interventions that allow us to address this. We wanted to kind of look at this issue of the bi-directionality of parenting. You know, a lot of people talk about you really have to think about parenting as not just what the parent does to the child, but how the child elicits certain kind of parenting. So we wanted to look at kids' neurodevelopmental risks. It didn't seem to matter, maybe because these parents were, you know, all stressed out anyway. But we did find that maternal detachment contributed to child behavior problems and partially mediated the pathway, and I'll just show you that path analysis in a, right now mediate the pathway between risk and children's problem behavior. So again, from an intervention standpoint, it suggests to us that we can do some work here and we can do some work here um, to try and get moms to be more responsive, not to be so flat in terms of their affect, et cetera. By the way, all of our parenting um, variables are from observed parenting behaviors and parent-child interaction. All right. Now, we also decided to look at maternal spanking. You all probably know this is a big issue in the field. There's some research um, that suggests that African-American families are more likely to spank their children, maybe with not such bad outcomes. Actually, there's been some research on adolescents who've done that, Vani's um, paper that I think about all the time. So we decided to look at it in little kids 
And actually, our findings differ somewhat from Vonnie's, to my grad student's dismay, because if she kept saying to me, I'm a black girl, and I was spanked, and I'm fine, which I always hate to hear, because I'm like, you are an N of one, an N of one. Let's think more <laughs> carefully about this. But anyway, we wanted to see if we saw the same thing. And in fact, what we saw that over half of the parents, and these are little kids under three, which you know, as a psychologist, I'm like really stressed out about this. But more than half of them reported. And you know, people don't always report things. So this is probably an underestimate. But over half of them still said, I spanked my kid. They were just as clear as they could be. You know, it's no problem. I just pop them and whatever they said. But we found out that, of course, stress, this parental stress issue was related to spanking. And it was related, spanking was related to toddler behavior problems. So. To me, the upshot from this is you don't, shouldn't spank your babies. I don't care if your culture says you should spank your babies, you just shouldn't spank um, your babies. And we were interested in this idea that Vani had and other people that said warmth was a moderator of the outcomes of spanking, and we just did not get that. So again, this is a small study, but what it suggests to me is that we have to really think about this issue developmentally. And for littlest kids, it's probably not so good. Was that just a yes, no, or like how did you measure spanking? No. We use the conflict tactic okay. scale. Do you know that? The yeah, Strauss scale. Mm -hmm. OK. So another thing we were interested in is, OK, what about maternal trauma? And how does that impact parenting? So we wanted to look at mother's experience of intimate partner violence. And we wanted to look at her experiences of child maltreatment. Now this is right here. This is a newer study. So this is our Latina sample. This is not our African American uh, samples that I talked about before. So we got almost 40% of the mothers reporting maltreatment as kids. And we heard some pretty horrible things, a lot of sexual abuse, et cetera. Um, by the way, our Latina families in our area are mostly from Central America. So they look very different from Puerto Rican families, Mexican-American families. But high rates of child <coughs> maltreatment experiences, and about a quarter of them endorse some kind of intimate partner violence. And again, this is self-report. So you always worry that they're underreporting. All right, so what did we find? Just really quickly that, as we would have expected, if you had low early maternal trauma, and low intimate partner trauma, you were a much more sensitive parent, right? And then we found that if you had low parenting stress, right, even if you had high early childhood maternal trauma, you were more sensitive as a parent. So here's our intervention point again, right? We can't go back and take the maltreatment away from these parents. But we can do something here about the stress they experience in the care of their children. And I'm going to tell you about a study we're doing at the end. All right. So now I want to turn to some of our work in child welfare, right? So those were our early head, some early head start findings we had. But I want to tell you about some work in child welfare. Again, for you students, I would highly recommend secondary data analysis because it certainly can move you along. I don't know for you all, but it takes me two years at least to collect my little clinical samples of 100 kids. It takes me a long time because I'm doing home visits and visits in the child care center. It just takes forever to get these data. And you've got to find the parents. Probably takes us um, three visits to get one research visit done, right? By the time you think about cancellations and things like that. So while you're waiting for that, and you know you've got to produce papers, produce papers, the good thing to go to secondary data sets. So this is NSCAL, which I love this data set. It's National Survey of Child and Adolescent Well-Being. We all know secondary data sets have their um, problems, but certainly they can ask certain kinds of questions. So here I was interested in looking at what was the baby's experience and how that predicted preschool outcomes. To my dismay, I didn't get something that every child welfare worker expects to get, is that the number of infant placements predicted preschool outcomes. But I'm going to tell you a little more about that because I worked on another paper where we dug a little deeper. This was just formal placements, right? And what we decided to do was dig a little deeper and look at every kind of move. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. 
We did find that if there were more children in the household, you got lower cognitive skills in preschool, lower language skills, lower social skills, and increased behavior problems. Those were all four of the uh, measures that we looked at, which suggests that these kind of families are probably at super risk, so we need to be giving them a special kind of more intensive intervention. We also found, and this is the home and observational measure, some of you might know it, that as you might expect, cognitive stimulation supported children's cognitive skills, social skills, reduced their behavior problems, again, which means we can do something in um, these families. These are all children who are reported to the child welfare system for maltreatment, so it's not like they have to you know, uh, be written off. And we also found on the emotional support section of the home reduced behavior problems. Now, we looked at an interaction between placement instability and emotional support, and we found that when the children had more instability, if you could get them more emotional support, their outcomes were better, right? So again, in terms of triaging, one of the things I like to think about as we think about prevention programs is what do we need to give to whom? So for these kids, like the ones with higher numbers of children, but also kids with multiple placements, those are the ones we need to really get in on and try to do um, some more parenting intervention. All right, so remember I told you we wanted to dig a little deeper because we were so surprised at what happened with my lack of finding with placement change. So a colleague who works at RTI said, well, let's look at this a little differently and we all got together and tried to figure out a more refined way of asking the question. So we looked at formal placement changes, but we also looked at informal placement changes, like when the birth parent would all of a sudden show up and take the kid. And what we found was 85% of babies, this is babies, zero to two years of age, had at least one caregiver change during the first year of life. So any of you who are attachment people in here know why I'm like cringing, right? Most of the children had at least one placement change. And by the way, most of the kids were with their birth parents, not with foster parents. This is all the babies who were reported to child welfare system and the majority stay at home, okay? And then around 40%, almost 40% had over four changes before they started school. So think about school readiness, forget it. Forget it. They can't be ready for school, right? They're changing a caregiver every year, 40% of kids. So, you know, clearly this has implications for what should we, we should be doing around supporting these families. What predicted placement stability? As you would imagine, higher level of risk. Child chronic health, these kids who have these chronic health problems are getting moved all over the place. So you think about they already have the health risk. But this is the one I didn't like because I'm an adoptive parent. I got bitten by the bug and I adopted my kids when I was 47. So I didn't like this finding, right? Because it suggests that somehow older parents are like, whoo, these kids are too much, somebody else take them. So I didn't like that finding. But anyway, greater st stability predicted by children who move first as neonates. And what we discovered when we looked at that is that these kids are going into adoption. So the kids who are moving in the first three months of life, and I have a colleague, Fred Wilson, who's really looked at age gradients with these children, and the neonates look very, very different than other babies. So he's arguing, and he's not even a developmentalist, that we need to be really thinking about the neonates as a whole separate case. If a kid had a physical abuse report, they were more likely to have a stable placement, which is counterintuitive. But as I mentioned to you, most of the children are neglected. And by the way, in terms of parenting interventions, we know better what to do about abuse than we do about neglect. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem. You know, These kids are probably getting some more support. And then caregivers with at least a high school diploma, maternal ed, as you all know, predicts a lot of good things. So that also predicts greater stability. All right. I also want to tell you about um, a set of studies we were doing. We had a small foster care population, and we decided to go really deep with this group of kids, so to look at some of the more traditional developmental kinds of um, measures with them. So we looked at emotion regulation, and I'm going to show you, um, you're not going to like it, but I'm going to show you a video clip of what we do to kids in emotion regulation tasks. But we, for this group, 
we gave them a, this comes from Hill Goldsmith, anybody know the lab tab? Anyway, you give the kid, it's not great, but a plastic box and it has this beautiful toy in it and you give them, these are preschoolers, you give them a set of keys and say, here, you open the box and you can play with the toy and what do you think? Keys don't fit. Not a key fits. So the kids trying the keys, trying to get to this beautiful, attractive toy, and they can't get to it. And we videotape their regulation of anger. Okay. For the joy, though, we give them popping bubbles. I'm quickly going to the joy, so you all won't be so mad. <laughs> Wait till you see what we do to the little ones. But anyway, we give them um, <laughs> um, bubbles, bubbles, and they have to stomp the bubbles out and swat them, and they just love it. They just love it. But anyway, we found that parenting predicts regulation of anger but not joy. And there's some research that suggests that joy is more situation dependent, so it almost doesn't matter if you have a bad parent. If you get taken to a birthday party where everybody's eating cake and having fun, you're going to have fun. So it's, parenting doesn't predict that as much as it predicts the negative uh, emotion regulation. We also looked at compliance and internalization, and that is, you know, if you know development, they talk about in the preschool period how you learn to be more compliant, and part of that is because you start to internalize standards for behavior, and you internalize your parents, so you even have a visual image of your mom telling you, don't you dare do that, and you have that repeated, that internal language in your head that keeps you from doing it. So we had this great measure um, that comes, assessment that comes from Grajna Kachanska, any of you developmentalists know her work, where she puts these beautiful toys out, things that make noise and beautiful animals and things like that, and the experimenter leaves the kid in the room and says, don't touch those toys. <laughs> so then we look and see if the foster mother says, don't you touch those toys while I'm out the room, whether the kid does it. So that's how we measure compliance and internalization. And what we found was that the foster mothers who were more accepting of their children's negative behavior, who didn't lose it when their kids did things that were inappropriate, were more compliant and had more internalization. Think about what that means for foster parent training. I don't know if any of you have worked with foster parents, but a lot of them are just good, sweet old custodial caregivers from the South who moved up North and who believe that children should do what they're told, right? If you have that kind of foster parent who gets upset if the child is doing something inappropriate and children who've been maltreated are bound to do something inappropriate, you see that the kids are really less likely to be compliant. So that has all kinds of implications for how we train and work with foster parents. Now when we looked at emotion labeling, which is basically, you know, we show a kid a face, we have this thing called Pat the Puppet, and they have to say whether the kid is happy, sad, or whatever, emotion labeling, knowledge about emotion, that parenting doesn't really predict that, but what does is language skills. So people consider emotion, language, emotion labeling as an important part of emotion regulation, but what it looks like is we need to give children not only the words for being able to say the emotions, but also enhance their language skills, which is a big issue for kids in this field. I didn't tell you all about this, but about 50% of the kids in um, child welfare have some kind of developmental delay. So it has implications for how, you know, the fact that we should be working on them around these kind of issues. Okay, so let me show you a video clip that you're not gonna be happy with me about, but I'm gonna show it to you anyway. So this is a clip of um, our current study, and it's an emotion regulation task. Um, that one that I was talking to you all about before was with preschoolers. This is with um, children under three, between six and 24 months or so. And it comes from the same group of researchers, but we show them scary masks. We call them silly masks, but any silly mask to a little child is scary. So one is a funny looking apple, one is a funny looking pear. You know, it's no big, it's not like a wolf. We show the preschoolers a wolf, which, you know, anyway. <laughs> um, but I will tell you all, let me just tell you that half of our preschoolers looked at that wolf and said to us, you've got to be kidding me. And they just pull it off the experimenter's face. They weren't afraid at all, not at all. Um, but you know, if you live a life where you're 
reality is scary, that little mask doesn't mean a thing. All right, so let me show you this kid. And I just want to ask you what you think about the parenting that you'll see. Um, so I'm just going to show this to you in the interest of time um, because it seems like we're not going to be able to figure this out. So what I want to tell you all is that this child has seen the mask, right? So what we're interested in, one, is the kid's capacity to regulate himself, which as you can see is not so good. But what's more important to us in terms of thinking about intervention, and this is an intervention study actually, is what the mom does in response to the child's dysregulation. So see if you can see it. I'm sorry we can't get it on the whole screen. We were able to do it before, but I don't want to take the time. So see if you can see what she does. permission to show you these videotapes in case you were wondering. We have a separate box for can we show this for training and educational purposes. Okay, so what did you think? We know the kid was dysregulated. What about mom's strategies? She didn't have one. Right. There was no strategy, right? That's pretty good. Um, although she was holding him, it didn't feel like she was really like hugging him or like trying to soothe him. It was just more kind of like she knew she should pick him up. She knew she could rock. She should rock him. Somehow she had internalized that from maybe her own caregiving experience, but it wasn't the kind of connection that you want to see, right? She actually was m making him more dysregulated. You know. Um, I don't know if you all could see, though, this child was not exactly reaching mm -hmm. for his mom. Mm -hmm. So from an attachment perspective, we're always worried about children who don't say, help me, help me, help me. These mean people have shown me these masks. Mommy, please. Mommy, please. I want to show you a different mom and what she did and see if you can see the difference. And it's going to be, you know, this funny. Were the experimenters in the room? Sometimes, sometimes moms feel embarrassed, yeah. and they want to distance themselves yeah. because they feel embarrassed in public. Yeah, the experiment, we do this all in the home. We don't do any um, data collection in the lab. We always um, are in a family's home. So yes, the data collectors are there. And you could see this mom giggling. Yeah. I think she was embarrassed. Nervous, embarrassed. Nervous, embarrassed. She also said, I don't know if you saw her pointing. She was pointing to the experimenters and what she said was, you know, you're, you're embarrassing me, you know, things like that. So she was clearly very anxious. Um, but look at this other mom. Same situation in this other little boy. Yes. Sorry you can't see the whole thing. Sorry. 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 He gets just as dysregulated, so get prepared with your ears. Sometimes they get dysregulated by being put in the booster seat too. That doesn't help. <laughs>
do this stuff, but then... But look, look at the difference in the child. <laughs> Mommy, come, he, the message is clear. Mommy, come help me. The other child could not send that message. <laughs> and after the kids screams, we say to the mom, go do what you need to do. It's bien, it's bien, it's okay. Aved, it's okay. Aved, she goes get him his blanket. She wipes his nose. She holds him close. She doesn't look embarrassed. Here's your favorite thing. And the screaming stops. So you see the difference. Totally different, same situation, which again, to me, this is a mom I say, check, goodbye, lady. <laughs> you don't need us, right? You don't need our resources. You're doing great. You're doing all the things that you should do. We're going to spend our resources on this other mom who doesn't have a clue. So with that, I'm going to go into a little bit of... Um, the work. So let me just quickly tell you a, a few little things about our intervention work. So, you know, I really have been enamored with how public health approaches these issues. And many of you might know they sort of think about it in these different levels, primary prevention, secondary prevention, tertiary prevention, um, primary being to decrease these big things. But you look at like community based public health interventions, like a home visiting intervention for everybody universal. Secondary, reducing environmental risk for toxic stress. So it could be like early head start, parent education in general, family support. And then these tertiary prevention programs are really the kids who've already been exposed to toxic stress like the child welfare uh, kind of cases. And they're more sort of these targeted interventions that are nowadays evidence-based, et cetera. So I want to talk to you all a little bit about early care and education as a secondary prevention and our parenting intervention as a tertiary. So you all probably know that there's a huge evidentiary base on what early care and education does for poor kids. It helps them to be more school ready, et cetera. But I want to tell you something that isn't talked about as much. One, for example, in the Early Head Start study, guess what they found? No effect on the families at highest risk. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Nothing. All that money, you know, $10,000 per kid, nothing for the high risk families. And the risks they were looking at weren't even the kind of risks that I've been talking to you all about. They were looking at things like those sociodemographic risks. The other thing that isn't talked about much is that the impacts were mostly for African American families. Nothing for white families. And that was a third of the early Head Start sample, zero. And what they found for Latino families was as where you'd expect in terms of language kind of outcomes, oral language, English, et cetera. So I got very interested in that. And I started to say, well, let me see what's going on with African-American families. Maybe that can help us think about this. And I also wanted to look at the risk factors. So I'm working with an Educare program. If anybody wants to know more about Educare, I'll tell you a little later. But I wanted to look at this risk issue and see if Educare, which is supposed to be early Head Start, Head Start on steroids, so higher quality, blah, 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 if they could do something about these risk factors. Well, we found that half of the families reported experiencing at least one adversity, but there were a ton of others, of course. We did find, as you would expect, the family adversity associated with worse outcomes, but not much. And this was not a randomized controlled trial. We were just looking at it. So we looked at dosage. Nothing for these families who were high risk. So Educare was not, as we had hoped, considering that they were high quality, they still didn't really help um, in terms of time in care. That's what we looked at as a variable. Um, the outcomes for these children. So again, further evidence that we need to do more than just this kind of secondary prevention approach for these um, higher risk families. 
I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we did looking at the African-American families. Just them, we took them out and wanted to look at them separately. We found that parents showed greater supportiveness if they had early head start, greater cognitive stimulation. The children, just, just African-American children, fewer problem behaviors, greater sustained attention, which happens to predict school readiness, by the way, and more engagement in play with their mothers. In terms of African-Americans and their parenting and their child outcomes, if parents were supportive, and we looked at it in these ob observations of videotape, we saw greater sustained attention with the kid, more engagement, less negativity, and if um, they were more cognitively stimulating, higher level of cognitive skills, higher level of language, decreased problem behaviors. Poor early head start African-American families. In terms of um, other parenting outcomes, if they showed greater harshness in the observation, we saw the kids, as you would expect, increased problem behaviors, less emotion regulation, lower cognitive skills. And if mothers reported more parental stress, which is something we're really interested in looking at, more problem behaviors, but parental worth wasn't related to anything, which was a bummer because, you know, obviously that's one of the things we want to push for. But these other things really have to do with skills that we can teach parents. So um, although we didn't get the parental warmth, there are other things that we can work on. Okay, so in indirect effects, there were small indirect effects of parenting as a mediator. You all see that I'm interested in that parenting bubble. Can we enhance that to make these children's outcomes better? If we could get parents to be more supportive, you got those kind of positive outcomes in kids. And if we could get them to be more stimulating, you can improve cognitive stimulation. So the argument is, if you can up the ante a little bit with parents, you can get better kid outcomes. This is particularly important for home-based programs that don't see the kids in the center. So the last thing I want to tell you about is the study that I'm doing now. And what we are doing, we have an Early Head Start University partnership. I don't have data for you. I just want to tell you about the study. We're doing a randomized controlled trial where we are adding an evidence-based parenting intervention to Early Head Start as usual because what I hope I've convinced you of is that early childhood intervention as a secondary preventive intervention, good, high quality early care and education, is not enough for these high risk families. You've got to add something else. And so was I ever lucky to see this granting um, this RFA for buffering toxic stress? Actually, one of my former students emailed me and said, Brenda, your name is written all over this grant. And I was like, you are right, I'm applying. <laughs> so my colleague and I at the School of Social Work applied, and we are adding Mary <coughs> Dozier's ABC. I'll tell you about it in just a minute. I'm going to show you a videotape, and then I'll stop. And we're comparing it to a light intervention book of the week. The parents get a book in Spanish and English. These are primarily Latino families book um, every week. They love the book. They love the book. Many of them would rather have the book because this requires work. Um, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. We're looking at the implementation. I'll tell you a little bit about what we found, but we're still in the throes of the RCT. We're doing qualitative and quantitative. And this is what ACF has asked us to do. Of course, you're always underfunded for these things, but they want us to validate this notion of toxic stress. And they said it was mandated in the RFA that you had to collect saliva. So ergo my first foray into physiologic data collection, which has become so fascinating to me because toddlers, any of you work with toddlers, you try to stick something in their mouth, they go like this. You know, no, you are not sticking that swab in my mouth. I don't want to give you saliva. On the other hand, we've had kids who said, you don't know what you're doing, give me the swab and do it and give it back to you. So, you know, it just depends on the kid. Okay. You can't. Um, they won't, the, we have a consultant and he doesn't want us to use anything that is potentially, could potentially affect the saliva samples, and he only would let us use this swab. There's a woman, Megan Gunner, I don't know if you all have heard of her, who's probably the, talk about a rock, she's a rock star. Um, she started this physiologic uh, work on cortisol, that's what we're looking at, cortisol levels. She actually gives the kids Kool-Aid, some kind of little <laughs> crystals, and as you know, that makes you um, salivate, but the kids love it because it's sweet and it's colorful. 
And our consultant said, we could not do it. And she told us why you can do it, but he says that it can affect the saliva assay. So I'm thinking it might be an interesting grant addition, like developing this tool of a pacifier. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you can make some money. You can make some money. And he, by the way, our consultant has made a lot of money. He was a Penn State professor. He created his own separate business called Salametrics. And he has made a ton of money off of people like us. So there you go. Make your money. Yeah, we went to spit camp. I mean, he's just got this whole thing going on. OK, so this is Mary Dozier's ABC. It's grounded in attachment theory. It's manualized, right? She got an NIH grant, manualized. She's done two randomized trials with kids in foster, in foster and birth homes, 10 sessions. That's all it is. And I'm trained as a clinician. I, my roots are in psychodynamic stuff. I was like, 10 sessions? Are you kidding me? You've got to be with family one or two years. But I am not a naysayer anymore. Um, we don't have all our data, but it's looking pretty good. But here's what she says really matters. It's this skill building, parent skill building in the moment. So I'm going to show you a video clip of a parent, but I'll just tell you quickly that our parenting coaches, we've got two wonderful parenting coaches, and talk about executive functioning. They have to really have a lot of it because they have to comment on what they see that the mother's doing. They have to relate that to the literature in a way that the mother understands, and then they have to relate it to child outcomes. We code them on the level of commenting and the quantity of commenting that they do, and they're supervised around that as well. Um, this is just what she looks at, nurturance, following the child's lead, reducing threatening or frightening behavior, overriding one's history or non-nurturing instincts, and you can't do anything else. Can't focus on safety. You can't focus on you know, concrete problems. This is all you can do. And I think that's why she gets the outcome she's gotten off a 10-week session. Of course, it takes us twice as long to do that because the parents aren't there. Anybody who's done this work knows that. But you can only con uh, focus on those things. So I just want to tell you a little bit about our qualitative findings. And then I'm going to show you um, a video. And then I'll end that mothers are loving it. They like it. They say, I think this is really making my child want to be with me. And that makes me have more fun in my life. And these are mothers who have immigration problems, depression, former child abuse. So for them to say, you're giving me away is having fun. The one thing that they're saying that is hard for them is this issue of following the child's lead. Because in their upbringing, you don't decide. You don't, the kid doesn't decide. You decide, right? Mm -hmm. So it's hard for them, but they're making strides. And the early Head Start home visitors have liked it as well. OK, so I'm going to just show you this one last clip. And poor Charles has to come up and help me here. Because I don't know why it was working before you all came. But I'm just going to show you this last clip. And while Charles is trying to help get it up, I'll tell you that one of the things that Mary asked us to do is do a montage at the end of the 10 sessions that has the parents' best moments. It's a very strength-based intervention. We don't do a lot of negative commenting. We're ca you know how the good nursery school teacher catches the child being good? We're catching the parent being good, right? And we're commenting on those behaviors. And we're saying, you see what you're doing? That's going to help your child to feel so good about his life or feel so good about himself. And you're going to see this mother. I love to show it. Mary doesn't like to sh us to show this mother. She's seen us show this mother because she thinks it trivializes it. But this mom is looking up to the parent coach as if to say, are you going to give me one of those good comments? Are you going to give me one of those good comments? So the parents start to feel much more efficacious in their parenting role. And they start to do this stuff while they're with the home visitor. And the early head start, the, our parenting coach, the early head start people say they can see a difference. In fact, we've had some families who said to the early head start folks, you're doing it wrong. You're not following the kid's lead. So it's interesting that the parents really have internalized that. But I think it's because they start to feel so good. So this is just, just a fun montage. I love to show this. The parents love to get it. They ask us for extra copies so they can send it to their families in El Salvador and Guatemala because it really chronicles what they're doing with their kid. 
So unfortunately, you won't be able to see the whole thing. But we put music to it. This is Whitney Houston, but we also have um, a song, Eres Tu. I don't know if any of you know that song. It's a beautiful love song in Spanish. We have that one we put to. All right, I'm sorry you couldn't see the whole thing, but this is a mom who has um, early maltreatment. She's in a situation where her husband is an abuser. She has a third grade education. I mean, every one of the risk factors I talked about. And what she said to us was, you made me have fun with my baby. So to me, that's worth it all. That's worth it all. So I just want to, and I won't, bother about bringing the slide up just to say to you in conclusion that you know what we're trying to do in my lab is think about the highest risk families using early care and education as a base you know sort of making sure everybody can get that kids and child welfare poor kids etc but really trying to add this additional piece that has to do with the parenting that we've studied and observed that we feel really would help children's trajectory in a much more meaningful way. And we are using other people's interventions like ABC and other evidence-based to try and just turn the dial up in terms of the positive parenting that children experience as a way to improve their early outcomes. So thank you, and any questions? I'd be happy to So raise your hand if you are a graduate student. Keep your hand raised if you are a graduate student who is interested in and available to have lunch with Professor Jones Harden right after this. That means you don't get to ask a question. <laughs> if your hand is raised, you don't get to ask a question. Uh, so we have exactly 10 minutes left. And I went over, of course, I told them I would. I no, 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 you did. You told me you would. So you, you upheld your promise. That's great. So uh, let's take about 10 minutes to, um, to have some questions here. Me? OK. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I'm a big believer, as obviously you are, in the importance of those family relationships for early children. Um, and these seem like really interesting and important interventions. I'm just curious, as somebody who knows the field a lot better than I do, are there similar interventions that incorporate fathers and kind of family functions? Um, I'll tell you, we're really behind. We're really behind. Um, 
This intervention, for example, that we're doing has never been tested with mm -hmm. dads. Um, the other evidence-based ones I'm thinking of, like um, PTIC, um, none of those have ever been tested with dads. Um, I have a colleague, Natasha Cabrera, who studies fathers, who picks with me all the time because I never include dads, partly because you know I need a decent enough sample, and it's hard to get um, a sample of fathers. So I, I would argue that the field is really, really behind. There are many promising practices with dads. Um, so I think those, there are many of those that exist in the literature, my colleague Natasha being one of the people who has tried them, but they are not evidence-based yet. Um, so they don't meet the, like the California Clearinghouse or the McVie funding criteria um, that's out there for really having research that's proven their efficacy and or effectiveness. And, and if, you, if you think about it, they have really no content validity for fathers, right? So the point is these are evidence-based programs designed for, for mothers. mothers. Right. So they're probably, maybe they would have a negative effect for fathers yeah. because they weren't, they weren't based on, they weren't developed for fathers. Mm -hmm. So the question, they don't have an evidence base for fathers. You right. could use them for fathers, but it would be like using a measure that you don't have validity on exactly. for a population. Right. I mean, the data even, um, just to support what John's saying on fathers, is that they interact with their children, young children, very differently. Yeah. So we don't necessarily want them to be doing the same thing that we do in these <coughs> interventions. Yeah. No, I was just wondering, because, I mean, Obviously, the maternal child interactions are very, very important, but <coughs> always that, especially in these families, the missing father is often such a big mm -hmm. problem. It's how, it's how do you bring him back in? I will say that with our Latina sample, again, ours is different from yeah. like Puerto Ricans, et cetera. This is a very coupled group. Mm -hmm. um, about 80% of our mothers have a husband or a partner living with them. So if we had the money and time, we could kind of test what it might look like to do a co-parenting kind of thing, but mm -hmm. we didn't look at it. I, I was very moved by that last video, and I, I feel like I definitely, like my cortisol goes down when I play with my kids, and mm -hmm. you know, like the stress mm -hmm. for me, I connect to mm -hmm. that feeling of like when I find joy in my kids, I, my life is better too. Mm -hmm. And. Um, but my question, anyway, so thank you for that. And the way I'm sorry you didn't, couldn't see it. I know, I know. So, oh, no, it was great. The music did it all. <laughs> um, but my question is, I work with teachers, and I think sometimes I struggle with the early childhood research and the importance of those years, because I feel like when kids don't have all of those positive um, things happening in their lives, teachers kind of write the children off mm -hmm. as like, well, they didn't get this, so now they're damaged goods, there's right. nothing we, nothing can, we do, can do, sure. you know? And uh, so I struggle with even like emphasizing the importance of the early years, even though obviously it's important and structurally, systematically, we have to find ways to support children in those early years. But when they haven't had all the right things to set them up for success in zero to three, I still believe there's so much good that can happen, particularly if teachers are not judging parents are working with parents and are also um, not writing them off. But so I, w I wondered if you have advice for how to work with teachers around I that. I mean, I teach in an early childhood education program, although I'm not an educator, but I teach students. And the courses that I typically teach are the ones around family and community and you know address your biases and all this kind of stuff. And um, one of the things, I, I say two things to them. One, I say that that mom, even if she is the worst mom from your vantage point, is important to that kid. Mm -hmm. And if you are really, really invested in that kid, you have to respect and care about that kid's mom, even if you think the mom is horrible. Even if she never comes to parent-teacher meetings, even if she you know, you know, never does the homework with the kid, that is who that kid is connected to. And you have a responsibility to that child to respect and value 
his parents because that's where this kid is coming from. So that's one thing I say to them, and I go on a whole big diatribe about it, believe me. Um, but the second thing I say is you have an opportunity here to give these children something that they may not get at home. So your investment to these kids who you think, you know, and you have to check your own biases and determine why you think they're not getting something, so do that. But if you think they're not getting the support they need, then you need to work even harder. Those are the children who need you more. And I try to talk to them about um, the school experience as being compensatory in certain ways for those kind of kids. So that means you have to be more stable. You have to give them help with transitions. You have to tell them when you're not going to be in because you're going to be sick. You have to create a safe environment where they know they're cared about and loved. And you have to develop a relationship with them that's different from your relationship with the other 20 kids in your classroom because they need you most. So I, I try to approach it from both those vantage points, whereas I say, hey, you have to love and respect from where that kid came, their community, their family, et cetera, even if it's different from yours. And the issue of you know, what you have an opportunity for with these children. They, we may not be able to get their parents better, although people like me are trying and we're hoping and that's what we're pushing for. But you have that child every day in your class. You've got them there you know, a good you know, 25 hours a week. There's a lot you can give. In that and from, from a developmental perspective, you are the point for predicting future success. Mm -hmm. right? So development is cumulative and, and, and progressive, right? So from that point here, you are the early intervention for the later development. Right. Right. OK, one last question from a graduate student who's not attending lunch. <laughs> or yes. A postdoc now. I'll take it. <laughs> for your talk was really informative and definitely reminds me of my grad school world. And I'm transitioning a bit out of that now because um, several, several points that you brought up regarding cultural differences, for example, African American families despite class, were really interesting to me and really hit upon this uh, trauma that we don't touch on as much with the race-based trauma. Yeah, so historical the cellular, trauma. This sure, sure, sure. piece you indicated was from uh, generations of trouble, but we know that there are things constantly mm -hmm. going on for parents mm -hmm. now. So what do you, what can you say about some of these interventions that um, impact families of, of various cultures that don't address cultural issues that they're experiencing? What can we do to kind of impact that? Well, I'm gonna answer that, but I wanna tell you about a study we're doing now, you know, um, one of the things I love about grad students is that they have so many ideas and so I can go off in all these different directions but one of my grad students is doing a um, dissertation on mother's experience of discrimination mm -hmm. because as you probably know there is data that suggests your perception even if it may not be real who knows if it's real that's not the point it's your perception of being discriminated against affects your health health so we are looking at um, discrimination in pregnancy, mother's perception of discrimination in pregnancy, as well as all the usual suspects that you would know by now what I'd have in there, chaos, trauma, blah, blah, blah. And we have one preliminary finding that it affects birth weight in these kids, um, which to me is just amazing. Um, we also have what you'd expect from my work that Trauma also affects kids' birth weight. So I don't think, to answer your question, I don't think the interventions address historical trauma at all. The trauma that you know we define typically in these interventions has to do with violence and that kind of thing. It doesn't really talk about things like race-based trauma. However, that said, I think there are people who are interested in this work who are pushing us a little bit. Like I have a good colleague, Marva Lewis. She's at um, Tulane. And she, like me, is very interested in these attachment-based interventions. And she's trying to 
bring in the cultural historical trauma piece in how we ask the questions of these mothers in terms of trauma, um, but also how we address it in the context of intervention. For example, one of the things that I didn't get a chance to talk to you all about is, you know, we're thinking about these mothers with mental health issues like depression and trauma that we would add another piece. And I have a few colleagues like Linda Bieber at UNC who has done that. So she's incorporated some sessions, cognitive behavioral sessions around depression and, you know, looking at the world more positively, blah, 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 in a regular early care and education home visiting kind of model. Um, but Marva has suggested that we add modules that relate to more of this historical trauma stuff, how you feel about being discriminated against, and make that part of the discussion around mother's affect, mother's capacity to care for their children, and incorporate that into it. So it's not um, ready for prime time yet, but people like her are pushing the field. She has come to zero to three several times. This last time we had her come, she had like, you know, 80 people in the room trying to think about how they can put these kind of issues in the context of intervention. So, you know, you're, you're on to something. Maybe you'll be the next one. So. <laughs> something like that. All right, please join me.